So our next speaker is Gary Caldwells. So uh, Gary is with Palo Alto Networks Global Solution, and he's the architect there. Um, and he has had a 27 year cybersecurity um, journey and who has taught and spoken at conferences across three continents to diverse business and technical audiences. He is a resident advisor to the Rogers Cyber Accelerator at Ryerson University and is a periodic guest lecturer at universities. Gary speaks on a broad array of cyber topics from foundational security principles to technical concepts of current interest. So please welcome to the stage Gary Caldwell's with your sock is doomed to fail. Collapse it and automate. Thank you very much. And, um, you know, just first off, inaugural B-sides for Cayman. And uh, I'm thrilled to be part of this. So thank you for having me. Um, I don't intend to be completely contentious, but obviously, the, you know, the title suggests that there's some contention, you know, potential there. Um, I understood from the front desk that there's at least three SOC providers that are uh, part of the conversation uh, in the two days. So, you know, if the tomatoes are ready to be thrown, have at it. It's all good. Uh, so again, thank you. Let's uh, let's dive into this. So, what is the mission of a SOC? Um, you know, fairly straightforward. Three three key things that we're looking for in the in the SOC infrastructures: threat monitoring, threat hunting, incident response. Right. Essentially, the ability to disrupt the operations of those that want to target and attack our infrastructures, get after our IP, get after our personnel, exploit our weaknesses. Right. So. We need to have an understanding of that entire picture, do constant review with our own and third party and external review, get our auditors involved, get feedback from them and all parties that we do business with so that we can have a holistic picture. John's call out for the CSERT type approach, a community type approach, I think is a very good one. Um, I think it's tremendously useful, um, particularly in an island community like this where it is a smaller community, um, a tight niche of, of potential players out of the 70,000 population where we have common interests, common stake in, uh, in, in, in working together on that. I think that's amazing. John, thanks for that. Um, really useful. So let's have a look. Tactics, techniques, and procedures, right? You've, Adam spoke this morning extensively about um, you know, the, the, the techniques approach. Um, on the deception side, amazing talk, very good uh, conversational. Just referencing specifically to that um, output, the most recent output for the MITRE Ingenuity attack evaluations, um, a really good paper that was, was produced, a study that was produced where essentially there was you know, 25, I think it was between 25 and 30 vendors took part in essentially an open study where it's like literally we roll up, we give you the technology and good or bad, they're gonna ex examine it, they're gonna put it through some stricture, they're gonna mark it against an evaluation structure and, a, and obviously a framework and from that will come an output um, and that output is published. So if you're subgrade or you miss key points or you have things in there that are maybe out of scope or haven't been covered well, bad luck for you. If you have good technologies, well implemented, well structured, understandable and translatable into something that people can use in a very effective way, great for you. And so if you read these reports, this one specifically is really interesting. You'll see uh, one of the things that's kind of cool is across the commentary from the vendors that were in play, all the CFOs, CTOs, et cetera, that made comment about the report's finding were largely positive. The nuance in there is, you know, how, how effusive the, the positivity was. Um, there's a handful in there that did incredibly well, as expected. Um, ourselves and our peers, it is what it is. Um, you know, great players, great technologies, good solutions, good thinking behind what can be done, um, specifically around uh, XDR and the SOC component and, and integration of those two things. But what, the, uh, what their study specifically looked at <clears throat> was they did modeling on Wizard Spider and Sand, the Sandworm teams. Um, you know, so the not picture thing obviously was Sandwim was, was well known for that. Wizard Spider with, uh, with ransomware attacks across a number of different infrastructures in finance and healthcare. I'm based out of Toronto. Um, I've dealt with healthcare and government exclusively for the last 18 months just as a, as a focus piece. And I can tell you that healthcare in general is, uh, is underfunded, is under resourced, and is, 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 is essentially struggling, in, in, at least in our Canadian context. 
Uh, we had a number of instances where that particularly was a bit people and, and cost them some money. Um, and for the public infrastructure, obviously, that's a problem for, for everybody. Um, the focus of that specific testing was tactics, techniques, and procedures to abuse encrypted data for impact. Um, I just the reason why I wanted to really circle around this is, you know, one of the things you have as a SOC is a volume of information that you have to deal with, you have to disseminate breakouts of what's important, how things are going to structure through your approach, through your teams, through your technologies to get you to a you know, decision point. Um, if you're not encrypting stuff, if encryption is part of, you know, that's, things are too scary, too complicated, too, uh, you know, too abstract, um, you're missing a, a great deal. Um, just a quick reference point, I think the current numbering on, on Google is about 96% of everything they see and touch is encrypted, at least in TLS format. So just decision and conversation around there. Uh, if your security practice excludes decrypting things, um, you've, got, you've got a serious conversation we need to have. You know, please take me aside and let's chat some more about that. So what is in the scope of our control? People, process, and technologies, as we all understand. These are foundational things that we've spoken about for a long, long time. Um, and it's the balance of budgeting, capability, currency, of, you know, of, of these three points that we can sort of pull together to give us a sense of where we're at, what our state is, and what we can do, right? So we can have great people, you know, maybe okay technology, um, you'll get frustration and will, will mount. And in the SOC conversation specifically, the traditional thing always was, you know, we're gonna build a, a framework, we're gonna have teams that will, you know, we'll do sort of level one folks that have, you know, a certain intermediate level understanding of what's going on in the environments, so they'll do some low level alert stuff, they'll process things through and hand it off to the, the smarter teams who will then do a next level analysis, maybe dig into what they're actually seeing and hand that off to the actual threat hunters who will get into the, the meat of things. Um, a common three tier SOC was what people structured around. And that is one of the aspects that is doomed to fail. It is impossible to maintain a staffed infrastructure given current conditions, given you know, what's, what, what people want to do and, and how they want to maintain interest and earn well. Right? There was a conversation probably about five years ago where this was a hot space to be. You know, the SOC was really catching on. More and more infrastructure was built around these by healthcare, finance, et cetera, where they had these unique teams, government, sorry, not to forget them, where they would have these unique teams that pull together to do these response pieces, understand what was going on, and do all of these things, you know, in, in very explicit terms. The single greatest thing that was a problem for that wasn't the technology, wasn't the process, it was just maintaining people in seats, right? Because we had a, mop, we had a, med, a sort of, a mapping and a modeling that said, like, for us to be fully staffed and fully functional, we're going to handle this many events by these many people, and this should be our expected outcome. And we have, an, you know, it's into events per hour that these people would be able to process, and that gives us a, a sense of where we're going to go. And as things, the velocity of attack, the velocity of problems increased, um, largely the people on the front lines of that got disaffected, looked at what they were doing, and said, now nah, I've got to be doing something different. Right? This is a shit job. I'm just getting swamped to this stuff. I can never keep up. There's no reward in this for me. I'm doing nothing that's really important and you know, will, will be interesting to me in my career. I'm literally just wading through slop. And they started packing that in. Real problem then, because that means that we had technologists that weren't going to generate to the second level, which is a, you know, the, one of the more important levels of that SOC modeling of the time. Um, and even more important with that, they were then in time generate and go up to the third level. Being those tier three analysts, you know, the super the guys in the Birkenstocks and the, the running shorts and the, you know, the running vest in the back of the room doing the really cool and sexy stuff. Um, those guys and ladies would, would you know, be a, a piece apart and they'd be the smallest sort of piece of the pyramid in terms of knowledge and experience. I will reference here very specifically, and I'm going to put this up in terms of like this graphic because I love the graphic for a couple of reasons. Number one, you'll see the eight FTEs. Um, if we'd had this conversation five years ago, we were that entity. Right, the largest commercial threat database in the world. We see and, and process uh, you know, attacks at a volume that is just unheard of. Um, and to deal with that, we had a 42-person SOC. So we were the model of, we have to have these three layers, we have to have these three managers, we have to have this, you know, this process that covers 24 hours and is global and all the rest of this, because that was the understanding of the times and that's what you did. There was a sea change in that where people started recognizing we, just, we couldn't keep bums in seats. Process, you know, we just we couldn't keep up with the process that we needed in terms of just adjustment for what we were going to be dealing with as the volume and the breadth of what we had to deal with increased, right? So the technology was the piece that had to change. 
And the technology drove a lot of change in a very practical way. Um, the biggest thing that was required to make that change, courage. Right, it was to, to say, like, we don't need 42 people. We need to winnow this down. We need to uh, let the technology take care of a lot of this for us. Trust in automation, trust in a playbook structure, trust in, in a, an approach that has a decision tree that we can maintain and grow and actually have time to work on and adjust, validate it you know, through our peers, validate it through third party. Our auditors can validate you know, what we're thinking of and doing within here and make sure that this is all sound. And so this is the picture today. Right? And you see that number there, it's 1.5 trillion events. This is 1.5 trillion events we face every 90 days. Right? I'll give you just a referencing. We block automatically about 224 billion unique events a day that don't even feature in this number. Right? We're producing about 4.3 million global signatures that are available to everybody within our infrastructures at a moment's notice. As soon as we see something new and we can codify it, it's, it's structured and sent out through the different technologies, about 4.3 million of those a day that are completely unique you know, and, uh, and valuable. So pretty cool numbers, pretty shocking in their own way. What's really, really cool is if we'd had this conversation three years ago, that number was 800 million. Right, so three years, 36 months, 800 million to 1.5 trillion. And it's just going up. Like every quarter, this number adjusts. It's crazy. What you see there, about a billion of those are just automatically taken off the top. These are such silly, like high-level stuff that it's, it's really just like scraped off and not even dealt with. Down to the next level, monitoring and alerting. So the breakout here, which would have been kind of your level one previously, digging through that chaff of all those alerts, all the stuff that's out there, right? Having that process through a decision tree in an automated way that would allow you to take from there 1.49 trillion events. Crystallize that down to about 6,000 alerts that you would actually care about. I mean, the numbers are just ridiculous, right? 1.5 down to 6,000 events or 6,000 things that you would care about. Um, you think about that in terms of like the FTE thing, eight FTEs, 6,000 events, 90 days, still quite heavy, but you know, we're, we're at least we're in the range now where you might actually be able to do something and still have a sip of water and you know, get back on the, the drumbeat of rowing the oar and pulling the galley forward, right? Um, so what you need from there is further analysis, further investigation. And again, technology, again, playing the biggest part within this, right? Getting the automation, getting your playbooks, getting different structures of playbook and decision tree so that you can see things that you've had before. You can recognize where things might be awful. We see something that's new and interesting and have to make an adjustment within there, right? And every one of those eight FTEs essentially functioning as a tier three at this point has to be able to be able to do those things completely throughout the whole cycle. I'll give you a little, little nugget about that that we don't publish, but it's kind of interesting. Those FTEs are nine to five. We don't have a 24-hour you know, SOC. We don't have a global presence. Right, we've got those FTEs, one manager, nine to five operation. We have automated everything behind that so that we have pager duty, two of them carrying the pager. at potentially not a pager anymore, but the pager essentially at any given time to respond to stuff that might come up at any moment. Really, really cool. Getting down to that, so 5,200 automated um, analysis and investigation functions that go on there, and then from that, crystallizing down to 800 manual investigations. So the actual cool work, the stuff that people research and, and potentially write about and go to their local B-sides or their local universities and have conversations about and share with, with everybody else, talk to John and people like that, you know, with a CSIRT type of a conversation, share with the industry peers that they, they're aligned with. Those are the sort of things we get into. Like that's the career building, interesting things that everyone always wanted to deal with by being a SOC analyst, right? And so it gets down to a crystallized function that we can actually manage in terms of time. So people process technology in function, in perfect harmony, gives us that type of approach. And the number at the bottom, the little gold thing down there, this is a 10 quarter, like 40 months we've been having this discussion with, with industry. Um, 10 quarters, no major incidents to date. And I'm actually gonna talk about part of uh, Sunburst and SolarWinds as a function of this, just to give an example of how poorly things can go, but you can still be, you can essentially still be covered within that in terms of a SOC infrastructure. So the enemies of the legacy SOC, and at this point, I'm just gonna take a little pause, and I'm just gonna make the statement. The conversation I'm trying to have with you is about numbers, it's about people, process technology, dealing with volume in a way that you can actually handle. This is not, despite the little conversation we had up front about, um, you know, the SOC will fail, 
This is not a knock on socks as an approach. This is very much an underlining and underscoring of how essential they are to every single operation. So no matter how small you are, no matter how big you are, you do need SOC type functionality, whether it's your own in-house or it is a managed security service that is applied and driven by someone else, audited and verified by their third parties and yours for functionality and effic efficacy. Um, it's very much, we, we're very much saying like SOC capability is definitely what we need. Um, legacy SOC, too many low fidelity alerts. Again, that burnout factor of just, I can't, I can't deal with this stuff, it's just driving me crazy. You know, this is just rubbish. Invest investigations are time consuming. And I've got a slide a little bit further on that'll deal with some of this sort of stuff. One of the things that was a challenge initially in changing from traditional SOC down to a very lean automated type approach is digging into these investigations, right? seeing what was time consuming, see where we were bound with things before in terms of having conversations with different stakeholders, different groups, third parties, you know, police and, uh, and national security infrastructure people that might be involved in these conversations. So in Canada, you know, you're going to have to go to CSE and, and CSIS and explain what you're seeing, why it's relevant. Have they seen this? Is this something that we can deal with? You know, et cetera, et cetera. Those things always take forever because everyone has to acknowledge whether they're going to even talk to you about the issue first and from there acknowledge and, and decide whether they want to engage with you on it. But there's a little nuance there that's very interesting. But anyway, it is, it is what it is. And then there's repetitive manual tasks, right? That sort of stuff is, just drives everyone nuts. And this is a function of what we've done for 30 years in cybersecurity functionally is those repetitive things, those things that you know, should be taken care of that you still have to slog through. You still want them checked, you still want them logged, you still want a record of them somewhere. But this is not a people thing, this is a technology thing now. And you should use it as such. So in legacy socks, important threats are missed, just a volume thing, right? Target, everyone remembers that. Alert fires, body recognizes the alert, calls it out, hey, there's an alert. The other side goes like, file. And months later, someone goes like, whoa, hang on. Something happened there. Nobody told us about this. And they're like, oh, actually they did, but oh well, you know. Not a great sort of approach. Continuous firefighting mode. Again, that dreaded thing of like just continuously being in that mode of never being able to maintain, never keeping up. As the volume increases, as you know, the, uh, as the problems sort of mount, you just, you're on the back step more and more and more and it just, it just drowns you, right? 90% of analyst time spent responding to alerts. Again, think of that pyramid. You've got to push that stuff aside, right? If you're wasting people's time doing that, you're going to burn them out. They're going to leave you. They'll go into something else. They'll be selling real estate and please give me a shout. I'm looking to move to Cayman, you know, at some stage in the next year. If you're burnt out SOC analyst and you're selling real estate, give us a shout. Let's go. Um, large SOC teams, so trying to maintain that the, the volume you'd need of people to deal with the volume of, of issues, of course, um, and high analyst, turn, high analyst turnover, right? The job sucks. Why would you do this? And so things to bear in mind. Let's talk about that example. So FireEye called this sunburst in December of 2020. Um, really interesting timeline here, and there's, there's a very nice little confusing narrative around this. So if you looked at the response to solar storm, what is we called it, Unit 42, our researchers call it solar storm, um, timeline's amazing because September of 2019, we saw an incident occur where there was a command and control call out from a device, locked, automatically blocked, locked down, and a signature created in our structure, right? The automation doing its job as we would expect. So great result. Further analysis, we take that thing offline, we look at it, contact the folks over there and say like, hey, um, something's going on here, this is out of bounds, it's definitely your process, we'll work with you, let's go on this thing. And there, you know, unfortunately this does happen in industry, you know, you, you do the responsible disclosure, you reach out to people and you say like, hey, this is something you guys should think about, here's a problem for us, and they're like, yeah, we're kind of busy over here, like, we'll get back to you. And so a month tricks by, and in October then the conversation really starts to like, Hey, so that thing you guys called out, we told you to basically bugger off. Um, let's have a talk about that and see what's actually going on. And then in December, FireEye recognizes they've been compromised by their clients, referencing, okay, shoot, things are happening in here. And they call it out and publicly publish the, you know, the Sunburst paper. So that's when you know, industry and, and people really got, whoa, hang on. Orion servers are everywhere. SolarWinds is common. You know, 
this supply chain or this, you know, this, this trust chain that's been essentially established in there is a real problem for us. And as an industry, it was kind of a big wake up for a lot of people to, you know, to sort of reanalyze about how, they've, how their trust structures work. And so let's dig into that. So Sunburst is a backdoor injected into, a, into legitimate SolarWinds Orion plugin, right? Digitally signed by SolarWinds. So the guys that structured this, the people that put this together, were smart enough to put that in a way and, and basically subvert that trust so that it could potentially propagate unnoticed. And the unnoticed part's really interesting because in front of Congress in the US, when the SolarWinds team had to go in there and please explain, they put it down to an, inter an intern, right? It was the old blame the intern trick. Um, I'm really, really happy to say that after that, the CEO actually came out and was, is, you know, you can Google it. Publicly, he came out and said, yeah, we should never have said that. It was, you know, that, that's not correct. We're not that kind of company. We're not a blame the intern group. Um, our, our, their own internal sort of investigation suggests it was a two-year breach of theirs that had gone on. Right, so timeline here is ridiculous. Like it's like with, so sometime from 2017 onwards, this activity was infiltrated into them very quietly, very stealthily, in play. Even with you know how this thing worked was was very clever. So when we saw it in September, one of the things that our guys noticed in their initial analysis was it waited a week or two before the DNS request would start coming out. So it was like in a it was in a stealth mode in terms of it would load, sit there quietly, and they just beacon out just quietly to see if, if it could get DNS request out to one of the, the tagged hosts. If it could, it generated uh, command and control traffic and it mimicked the, you know, the uh, Orion updates. So very easy to, you know, in a, common, in a common sock with volume spraying everywhere to not even catch this thing, right? To see this thing, like, there's an Orion update going through. Yeah, we've seen 5,000 of those this week. Great, off we go, next. Um, so the timeline here is really, really cool. If we look at actually how this works, I'm just going to dig this through from points one to six. SolarWinds Orion downloads the malicious code. Sunburst checks through DNS after that week or two, like just literally a little beacon out, like, hey, you know, calling home. Response, you know, if it can get out, gets the response back. It then downloads and executes the Cobalt Strike attack. That's the point. And if you see Murray around, she's got the pink hair. She's, uh, she spoke yesterday, I think. Um, She's the XDR expert actually in this space. Um, that's the part where the XDR component, literally the endpoint component fires up and says, yeah, this is out of bounds. This is beyond the processes that we accept. Quarantine the machine, lock it down, generate a signature, alert the rest of the world, like there's a problem here. Right? And it was based on that that we then do the analysis and feed this out. So the automated SOC does its job, the automated technology does its job. In concert, these things need to feed together and be obviously programmed and reprogrammed and restructured together consistently. And the, you know, had this failed, Cobalt Strike would establish that C2, lateral movement would occur, exfiltration would happen, and you'd be you know, one of the many companies that, uh, that suffered through that and had a very panicked and, uh, and painful cleanup. Right. So the game changer, what do we have to do about these sort of things? Right. PPT dynamic in play here. Modern prevention, it's obviously technology that actually prevent, not just alert. Um, strong configuration within those to maximize the capabilities within there. I've had a number of conversations since I've been here since yesterday. One of the things consistency as an industry that we fail on is we're very good at looking, looking at what we need to do, understanding you know, to a large degree what is required of technologies to implement them and do things with them. Um, actually doing that, actually going through the pain of deploying them properly, validating them, again, to ourselves, through our, our, our peers and partners and third-party validation um, and making sure that we maximize what we're using and what we've got is an industry problem. Um, you know, there are ways to simplify that and automate some of that as well. So I'd encourage you to think about that. High fidelity alerts, fast investigation. So the speed to response is critical, right? Having things sit there, again, like the target example, hey, there's an alert. Crickets, crickets, cricket, crickets. Hey, what was that again? Doesn't work. Like you, you've got to be like it's got to be almost instantaneous. Um, and the use of SOAR, right? Security orchestration and remediation technology. Right? The combination of those three things together has an absolute automatic impact on your SOC. Right? This is where you start to saying, you know, we, we don't need the people anymore because we can apply the technology in a very specific, very useful, very efficacious way. 
get high fidelity input from that, automate how we're going to deal with that, and then the SOC essentially falls into line as we start getting those beautiful inverted pyramid diagrams. Right? The ideal here being a 30-30-30 model, 30% 30 of alert response, 30% on hunting what's going on, and then 30% on alert improvement. And the, the key thing here is, and this is like if you look at the John Kinderbeck zero trust approach, one of the key things that John referenced to was like defining the approach, defining how your zero trust philosophy is going to apply, but you have to revalidate consistently. Right? This is not a state in time and then walk away. Right? We don't do this thing, go to the beach, forget about it, and come back in six weeks and hope it's all good. This is an ongoing review, ongoing check-in on what we're doing, ongoing validation. Again, ourselves, our peers, and third party to make sure we're doing the right things. And so in a broad diagram, how this would work is essentially on the left, in the blue, you have all the different you know, technology components that you can apply. And these are, this is not exhaustive. This is a representation of the common sort of things. So firewall of some type, you know, SaaS security of, of some type, um, cloud security app, you know, mechanisms of different types, um, some sort of a SASE approach, and then potentially XDR component within there as well. Um, XDR just being, you know, EDR, but that it covers more than just the endpoint is, is the, what the X is for. So looking at that, we cover the reconnaissance phase, weaponization, exploitation, <clears throat> and your installation phase with technology very specifically focused and set to deal with those things. And then when we get to command and control, your lateral movement and the actions on the objectives, that's where you look at, you know, looking at the threat analysis and hunting components and feed that out to essentially what I'm arguing for is a playbook type approach. Right? Automating everything that you can within that is key. So just an example of a SOC playbook structure. Um, a lot of people when they, when they talk about SOAR, you know, have some concerns about the complexities involved, you know, the nuance of their environments in terms of their geographic you know, dispersal, um, the networks, the you know, history of the networks, who, who, who knows and owns everything. Simple example, I talk to the banks in Canada an awful lot. Um, you know, there are people that, that are at the bank, as an example, that just one of the major banks. He's got one guy. He's the proxy guy. And the reason why they can't get rid of the proxy is because Brad knows it. Right? He's the guy that runs that infrastructure, and that's his guarantee of you know, future security is that he's, he's the only one, essentially, that can run that stuff. Um, there's an awful lot of that sort of siloing and fiefdoms that go on. When you try and apply a SOAR technology into spaces like that, you'd have to involve people all over the place, all these different fiefdoms, lots of conversations, lots of true understanding of what the network actually has. Right? So when my little you know, instance of something that happens to be at a Caribbean bank and beacons out once a, once a quarter to give me an input you know, via the old X, you know, X86 modem or whatever it is that's still communicating with us, and it's the banking thing that nobody's allowed to touch because it still works. Things like that that are just little abstracts out there, and that's obviously a silly example, but when you have things like that in your environment that people don't understand or that are poorly understood, they really become the corner cases for SOAR and, and get interesting in terms of how you can apply them. I'm here to say playbook approach, SOAR approach, is really well understood, it's very well documented, and the best thing about it is for the most part, the vendors that produce and, and derive these technologies have massive communities with, who share with each other playbooks that they've already generated for different instances. So this is not a day one thing of like, hey, we're going to go to 40, you know, from 42 FTEs down to eight because all this stuff exists. Of course, there's work that's involved. But I'm here to say that you know, with all the complexity that we represent out in, the, you know, in a slide like that, and this is really just an abstract of the high level sort of approach, um, a lot of the stuff's already been done. A lot of it's public. You know, you can go on the GitHub for Demisto as an example, or Phantom, and you can actually see like what people have done, what they're sharing, what's current, um, variations of what's been done before. It's, it's all there. Um, so that makes things really interesting. So what you want to break it out to or think about is incident-based playbooks, analysis sub-playbooks, right? Again, thinking about that, that funnel that I drew. Indicator scripts, breaks those upon the trigger, upon you know, detail gathering for further analysis or further support of decision. Containment, escalation, remediation, and then post-incident metrics and re-improvement. Right, so it seems like a bit of an eye chart. It seems pretty complex. It's really, really that, not that, that awful at all. This is one of the argument areas for SOC as a service. Right, there's a lot of stuff that can go into this. Um, there's a lot of work that can be put into place. 
And experts in the SOC fields, experts around SOAR, can really make everyone's life a lot easier by coming in and working with you guys, doing analysis of what you have, binding it then into this type of an infrastructure. So I said earlier there was a, a slide on here that would talk about the FTE component and you know how you can rationalize time against cost and, and time of doing these technologies. Just a quick brief one in here. Um, this is a real example. It's our own, obviously, so just bear with us on that. Key things in here in terms of savings. Automation types, enriching the alerts. 1,090 alerts enriched gives us 635 hours back, right? Deduplication of alerts, like 7,700 of those gives us 648 hours back. And so as you go down here, I mean, it's, I'm not going to read through each one. The eye chart is, is good. The, the message there is, in one month, if we can save 1,400 hours, that's a, real, that's a real turnaround in FTE. And that's the point, right? We, so we draw, the, we draw the, the funnel, reference eight FTEs, give you the example here. And of course, these go on for all, all different components of your network, all different components of your life, um, including the bottom one. The other jobs is like all the other little menial, you know, interesting things that could go on. I mean, you can even use XOR technologies as an example to do automatic onboarding and offboarding of personnel, right? And literally just have that as a playbook, right? Joey's leaving, Kelly's leaving, put them through there, just offboard them, it's done. Right? It's very straightforward. And so where this brings us to is, and this is a really an agnostic slide, this is kind of a, a panacea, this is a vision of the future for what we'd like to see as an industry, this is where things could be really useful. This is the perfect sort of new world, right? A new SecOps team. So reset the table, reset expectations, get away from the old views and look at these. You want to assess and organize all your alerts and infrastructures around there. Look at your roles and responsibilities, what interfaces they touch and have access to and can implement. Look at operational establishment, sorry, enablement, um, proactive visibility, how that can be applied, where it's useful, um, what metrics you require, reporting, and again, across the three spaces, your own, peers and partners, and then third party. Um, autonomous security operations, largely the function of this talk and then continuous improvement. And again, you know, referencing John's foundational paper from 2010, continuous improvement is a, is a theme that we should all be pursuing at all times as cybersecurity practitioners. So that is the talk. I'd love some questions, and I'll thank you for your time. Yes, please. Yep, microphone's on its way. Okay, this has nothing to do with my workshop coming up. <laughs> um, Promote it. But, but I am curious how you would um, integrate deception tech, honeypot technologies, and et cetera, into today's SOC and how you expand your, oh, your detection capabilities. 100%. So like, anything you have that has an input that is useful and valid, like those technologies, you can absolutely feed in as part of your playbooks to give you inputs towards your analysis. So analysis isn't just from those security technologies I referenced there, which are like commercial. They can be anything. So like OSINT, you can take deception technologies. You can even take partner inputs. Um, you know, so one of the things that you see in industry these days is more and more stuff around sharing of IRCs at, you know, at a commercial scale where there's 10,000 plus a day that we all share with each other or more. They can take those inputs and feed them all through in the same time as well. Yeah, that's tremendously valuable input. Thank you. None of, the, none of the SOC guys are going to throw tomatoes? Come on. I was promised this. I feel let down. Your talk was so good. Everyone got all their... Oh, well, yeah. that, that, that's very gratifying. Anyway, so thank you very much. <laughs> Ten minutes early. I'm early to get you to lunch. Remember me for that at least. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks a lot.